Hello everyone and welcome to this video on coronary calcium scoring limitations. Over the past 10 to 15 years, the coronary calcium score has become a widely used test to assess someone's risk of a future heart attack. However, it is extremely important to understand these tests limitations which if ignored could lead to serious consequences. In this short presentation, I will highlight two key factors to consider when it comes to calcium scoring and to emphasize the importance of these limitations, I will wrap up with one of my cases from a few months ago. So let's start. In this presentation, I will talk about two groups in whom we don't recommend calcium scoring. First, patients who have already been classified as high risk for heart attack and second, patients who present with symptoms such as chest pain. But in order to understand the reasoning behind these recommendations, it is crucial that we first learn how risk is calculated and how patients are categorized as high risk in the first place. And to explain why calcium scoring is not recommended for symptomatic patients, like someone who presents with chest pain we first have to know what the causes of symptoms are. Before answering those questions, let's have a one slide refresher about calcium score. Calcium score is a non-invasive CT scan that measures the amount of calcified plaque in coronary arteries. It gives us an idea of a patient's future risk of heart disease. It is important to understand that calcium scoring does not directly detect plaques. It only detects the calcium inside them. This means that a large plaque without any calcium can go undetected by this test. By the way, plaques are fatty deposits in the arterial wall that accumulate over years and are the main drivers of the heart attacks and strokes. For example, here we have a cross-section of a coronary artery with a large plaque blocking over 50% of the lumen. This is a very concerning and significant finding that raises the risk of future heart attack enormously. Now, the general idea is that calcium usually deposits within these plaques over time, making them detectable, basically putting them on the radar. But in some cases, like a young patient with familial hypercholesterolemia, large plaques may be present without calcium deposits. In these situations, CT calcium scoring can easily miss these plaques. So CT calcium scoring detects plaques only and only if they contain calcium deposits, otherwise it misses them. The other point in this slide is that the primary goal of this test is to assess the future risk of heart disease. Calcium scoring is all about risk assessment and not diagnosis. After this brief overview, let's go back to the two questions and see how someone is categorized as high risk for a heart attack. To calculate someone's risk of future heart disease, we consider various factors such as age, gender, cholesterol levels, blood pressure, smoking status, and history of diabetes or heart disease. We enter these factors into a risk calculator, which then estimates the likelihood of that person having a heart attack or stroke within the next 10 years. To access this calculator, search for ASCVD Risk Estimator Plus. But before using this risk estimator, it is essential to remember that this calculator should only be used for primary prevention. This simply means that if you have had a heart attack, stent, or bypass surgery in the past, or if you are known to have coronary artery disease based on previous imaging, then you are high risk. And further risk calculation or calcium scoring is unnecessary. And this is a close-up of the calculator. 
we can see various required fields like age, sex, blood pressure, cholesterol level, diabetes, smoking status, and so on. Assuming you have had no prior heart disease, this calculator provides a 10-year heart attack risk estimate. Now, if your risk is over 20%, you are considered high risk, which means you need intensive medical therapy, smoking cessation, and significant lifestyle changes to reduce your risk. In this case, a calcium score won't help. Even if your score is zero, you still need therapy. You can't ignore diabetes or hypertension and continue to smoke just because of a low calcium score. On the other hand, if your score is high, it also doesn't change anything. You still need therapy and risk factor management. If you are in the intermediate category, a calcium score can be useful in nudging you towards either the low or high risk group. This helps determine the intensity of your therapy. For example, if your cholesterol is mildly elevated and you are in the intermediate category, a calcium score of zero can be reassuring. It gives you time to make lifestyle changes and reassess the situation without medications if you prefer. But your, if your score is high, it pushes you towards the high-risk category, emphasizing the need for intensive medical therapy and lifestyle changes. Even for those in the low-risk group, a calcium score can be helpful. We should know that some important risk factors like a strong family history of heart disease, high LP little a, or the presence of the inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis that are known to increase the risk of a heart attack are not yet included in risk calculators. Imagine you are a 50-year-old man with a strong family history of heart disease, but you don't smoke, you don't have hypertension or diabetes or a very high cholesterol. In this case, you might be classified as low risk by the risk calculators. Now, if you do a calcium score and it comes back as significantly elevated, you are not low risk anymore. Hopefully, we can now understand why we don't need a calcium score test in people with high risk of coronary artery disease. To answer the second question, let's see what causes cardiac symptoms such as chest pain. Let's take a look at this simple diagram of the coronary arteries. There are three main arteries surrounding the heart. Their main job is to deliver oxygen and nutrients through the blood to the heart muscle so the heart can continue to pump. Now, if there is a severe blockage in any of these arteries or their main branches, the blood supply to the heart muscle can be compromised, which is called ischemia. This lack of blood supply or ischemia causes symptoms like chest pain or shortness of breath with minimal exertion. If the blockage becomes complete or 100%, that's when a heart attack occurs. Have a look at these cartoons showing a cross-section and a longitudinal section of normal coronary arteries. As you can see, they have a wide opening or lumen free of fatty deposits or plaques in their walls. However, over time, these fatty deposits can start to accumulate and grow larger, leading to a partial blockage of blood flow. The more risk factors and unhealthier the lifestyle, the sooner these plaques appear and potentially causes blockages at younger ages. In more severe cases, the blockage becomes significant, leaving only a tiny passage for blood to flow through. In this image, you can see the coronary arteries with different types of blockages. For example, here, there is a large plaque or fatty deposit that has grown and is reaching the opposite wall, nearly blocking the artery. And here we have fatty deposits on both sides of the wall coming together and obstructing blood flow. With these blockages, you might not feel chest pain or shortness of breath while at rest because your heart isn't demanding much oxygen.
But when you start doing physical activity, your heart needs more oxygen. As there is a severe blockage, these increased requirements cannot be met, which leads to ischemia or inadequate blood supply causing chest pain or shortness of breath. Now that we have discussed the causes of chest pain and symptoms, let's explore why ordering a calcium score for symptomatic patients isn't the best approach. When someone experiences symptoms like chest pain or severe shortness of breath with minimal exertion, we need to investigate the possibility of severe blockages that could lead to ischemia. In other words, we need to determine how narrow the arterial lumen is. The thing is that a calcium score test isn't designed to do that. It only detects the presence or absence of calcium. This test doesn't provide any information on the presence or the severity of the blockage. If there is no calcium, it can distinguish between any of these images regardless of the severity of the blockage. For instance, in this image, where the blockage is mild, if there are calcium deposits, your score would be elevated. But in this other image, where the blockage is quite severe, if there is no calcium, your score would be zero, and a serious blockage could go undetected. This can be especially problematic in high-risk young people, as more time is needed for their plaques to calcify and they mostly have non-calcified plaques, which cannot be detected by calcium score. I hope this helps clarify why we shouldn't rely on or order calcium scores for patients with symptoms as it's easy to miss these types of blockages that are the real culprits. Now let's take what we have learned and apply it to a real life case from a few months ago. Picture this. A 37-year-old man visits his primary care doctor complaining of recent shortness of breath and throat pain during exertion. These symptoms have been limiting his activities, especially for the past three weeks. He has been feeling anxious and avoiding getting checked out, fearing he might have a serious condition. His medical history was notable for hypertension, high cholesterol, and mildly elevated sugar levels, a condition we call pre-diabetes. Despite this, he hasn't been prescribed any medications in the past, thinking he was too young to be on meds. He is a non-smoker and has no family history of heart attacks and leads a sedentary lifestyle. His lab results reveal a cholesterol level of 7.5 millimol per liter or 290 milligram per deciliter, LDL 5.5 millimol per liter or 212 milligram per deciliter and an HbA1c of 6.7% signaling the onset of diabetes. It's important to note that his cholesterol has been consistently high for the past 5 to 10 years. His blood pressure measured 145 over 104 millimeter mercury his BMI was 28, and his ECG appeared normal. Sadly, a CT calcium score was ordered for this man, and it came back as zero. Based on this result, he was reassured that his risk of coronary disease with a calcium score of zero was minimal. But looking back, we can see that calcium score was entirely unsuitable for this patient. First, he had symptoms, and second, he was already at high risk for developing coronary artery disease due to several untreated risk factors. One notable factor is his consistently high LDL level of 5.5 millimol per liter or 212 milligram per deciliter, which could even suggest possible familial hypercholesterolemia, putting him at substantial risk. He didn't need another test to assess his risk. Instead, he needed a test that could replicate his symptoms for a proper assessment, like a stress test. 
as his symptoms continued, he was referred for further evaluation. He had a stress echocardiogram and could only exercise on treadmill for four minutes, achieving five metabolic equivalents before complaining of shortness of breath and throat pain. Five METs is equivalent to the energy you spend raking leaves in the backyard. This is a very low level of fitness for a 37-year-old man. However, even at this level of exercise, he had symptoms and changes consistent with significant ischemia on ECG. This is his echocardiogram after a stress test, which shows an abnormal motion in this part of the heart muscle or myocardium. All these changes are suggestive of an underlying severe blockage in one of the main arteries and ischemia. He also had a CT coronary angiogram. If you need to learn more about the difference between a CT coronary angiogram or CTCA and a CT calcium score, check out this video. As we can see, the RCA and LCX arteries look wide open with no blockages, but the LAD artery is nearly blocked, what we call subtotal occlusion. By looking at these images, you can appreciate why his calcium score was zero. It's because there is no calcium in these plugs that have almost occluded the artery. There is only a tiny passage left, which allows a minimal amount of blood to flow through. This amount of blood supply may be enough at rest, but the blockage becomes apparent as soon as the demand for oxygen increases with exercise. No more blood can be supplied to this part of the heart muscle, which leads to ischemia and the resulting symptoms. He underwent a coronary angiogram at the hospital, which once again revealed the severe near occlusion of the LED artery. The blockage was successfully opened with a stent. These are two still images of his invasive angiogram before and after stenting. The blockage was so severe that the artery was hardly visible. After the angioplasty, you can appreciate the large size of the artery, which supplies a significant area of the heart. He was just days away from a complete occlusion and a massive heart attack. Ironically, during those days, he was undergoing the wrong test, which gave him misleading and reassuring results. The main learning points to remember from this presentation Calcium scoring is a risk assessment tool and not a diagnostic test. Calcium score should only be ordered in asymptomatic and low to intermediate risk patients. And last but not least, calcium score should never be used to assess patients who have cardiac symptoms such as chest pain. And that wraps up our discussion on the importance of choosing the right test for the right patient. Don't hesitate to comment or ask questions and thank you for watching. If you found this video helpful, be sure to like it, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more videos on heart health. Take care and stay healthy.